everyone, and welcome to Soul Talk. I am your host, Soul, and I'm here joined by one of my very good friends from high school and one of the people who actually introduced me into anime, my friend, Walker. Walker, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. That's great. Good. And we're going to be talking about uh, things we recently read, watched, etc. It could be things that have recently come out or things that are several years old, so let's get into it. Uh, Walker, going into our first topic, what have you recently read? Uh, so a couple things I've recently read uh, are the Adventure Zone graphic novel, uh, which is by the McElroy brothers and their father, uh, in addition to, I think it's Carrie Peach, Peach uh, who is their main artist and works with them on storyboarding as well as like kind of planning all that. Uh, it just kind of follows the adventures of their D&D podcast, the Adve- uh, can't talk. <laughs> The D&D podcast, The Adventure Zone, which they put on a couple of years ago, and it's still running. They're on their third season now, uh, but the graphic novel follows their first season, which is The Adventure Zone Balance. Um, and it's kind of a, an interesting take on their an original podcast, which was run through modules originally. So a few of the names and characters have changed, but for the most part, the story stays the same. Uh, and it follows the adventures of uh, the wizard Taco, uh, the fighter Magnus, and the cleric uh, Merle as they go about discovering and unraveling the mysteries of this world and this organization that kind of seems to follow them around. Um, outside of that, I've been also reading Lore Olympus, which is a webtoon that kind of takes traditional Greek mythology and reimagines it a bit. Okay. Um, it follows around uh, Persephone and Hades as the primary characters, but there's also a supporting cast of various gods, sprites, and other you know nymphs and spirits uh, that kind of paint an interesting picture of how everything keeps going. I love uh, when you go into like Greek mythology for things, as uh, I've people who probably seen the f- episodes one and two. This is my Percy Jackson shelf. That has <laughs> <laughs> Greek and Roman and Norse and <laughs> Egyptian. So uh, is it just focusing on Hades and Persephone in that? Hades and Persephone are the main characters in this story. It is centered around them. It's a unique take on how their relationship starts. So that's kind of the central focus, but it's not necessarily like the driving force chapter to chapter. Like each character has their own issues and their own like entanglements. And a lot of the story as well is kind of finding out uh, Hades and Persephone's backstories, as it were. And there's a lot that even now, about 100 chapters in, we still don't know. So it's Does it, is it taking... Is it more uh, going along with the regular myths, or are they changing things up a bit? They're changing a few things up, specifically. Um, It does fall along the standard kind of myth route, but there's a few key things that are changed, like when Hades and Persephone meet, um, key events that happen uh, in between, like, everything that, that... the traditional myth portrays where Hades, like, kidnaps Persephone, she eats the pomegranate, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of things between point A and B that are drastically changed. And on top of that, the one thing I find very amusing is that um, for the gods, their world is is the same as ours. It is t- technologically advanced and they are Total. living like miles ahead of mortals. So anytime they go to the mortal realm, they're like, hello, we are great and powerful. And they're like, God, I really miss my cell phone. You know, like <laughs> it's, it's amusing. So is the mortal realm set more like it's set like ancient Greece, okay. like all way back when. Whereas so the gods uh, are now, and <laughs> well. yeah, they're they're way ahead in terms of technology and stuff. It's pretty crazy. That sounds like a lot of fun. And I know you were saying earlier, like off camera, that it's a pretty adult graphic novel. Yes. Um. So the webtoon itself doesn't actually have an eighteen plus rating, but it does deal with very mature themes in certain chapters. Um. And it does have like a trigger and content warning at the start of each chapter that has said content. Um. But just fair warning going into it, if anybody's interested in taking a look at it or reading it, or if they haven't already. Um, there is some stuff y'all are gonna like some themes that the comic deals with that are a bit on the rougher side of things. I really uh, appreciate when books or comics or just 
things in general, like TV movies, like they give you that warning and tell you, hey, like these are the themes that are going to be in because you never know what might trigger someone. So it, that's mm-hmm. very good that they do that. Yeah, it's it's very professionally done. I really like uh, Rachel Smythe's take on the whole Olympian world. It's very, very good. I never heard about this until today, and now it's like <laughs> shot up to the top of my list because, again, Percy Jackson shelf. I like uh, <laughs> mythology. <laughs> yeah, plus webtoons. I be- I believe it's still free. I think it's free. It's free. I want to say it's free. <laughs> free is good. <laughs> and so you can read up. Usually, with most things, you can read up to a certain number of chapters, uh, and then the like. Once you hit like the cur- air quotes current stuff, they'll be like, "Hey." Uh, you know, if you want to buy coins to to see this new episodes or, or subscribe or uh, support the artists on Patreon so that you can get access to their stuff early. I'm like, I'll just wait. <laughs> I, I'll just I'll just wait. You know, once I've got spare money that I'm not throwing into savings. Yes, I'll I'll give money to people. But right now I can't. <laughs> How much is out so far? Uh, I want to say I think they're up to one thirty six. Oh, uh, chapter one thirty six. Um, yeah, but you can get through the chapters pretty quick. Like I, I could, you could probably binge the whole thing, like get, like read through everything in maybe like four, uh, no, four hours is a lot. If you, uh, I don't know, I read slow cause I like to take in everything. Uh, so I, I'll say four hours for me. Okay. Hey, that, that's an afternoon. Yeah. All right, so we're going to go into my recent read, which I read uh, The Villain's Duology by V.E. Schwab. And so not to spoil the second book, we're just going to talk about the first one. Mm-hmm. And uh, But V.E. Schwab is slowly becoming one of my favorite authors. Uh, she's also known for her Darker Shade of Magic trilogy, which is, uh, if you haven't heard about it, it's about four Londons. And uh, basically, you have these people called Antari that are the only people that can travel between the four Londons. So you have like a gray London, which is our world, a red London that has magic, a white London that also has magic, but is like much rougher. And then a black London that used to exist, but doesn't exist anymore. So that's a just side note, cool uh, book series that you should go check out if you haven't yet. But back to um, the Villains duology. Uh, which the first book is called Vicious. And uh, you have these two best friends and roommates in their senior year of college as pre-med students working on their thesis papers. Uh, Victor's thesis is on adrenaline and how people can temporarily do amazing inhuman acts like a mother lifting a car so it doesn't crush her baby. Uh, Eli's thesis is on EOs, otherwise in the book known as Extraordinaries. Uh, so it's spelled out extraordinary, but like the O is capitalized to make you know that you are saying Extraordinaries. Um, and these are people that have permanent powers, like a superhero. Now, most people don't believe in EOs, and so they were kind of like, what are you doing why are you doing this thesis? This is kind of dumb. You're a really smart kid. You're top of the class. Why are you researching this? But the teacher eventually is like, okay, cool. We'll, we'll let you do it. Cause uh, he was only going to work on it in theory, not actually try to create an EO or anything or try to prove its existence. Just talk about the theory of it possibly existing. However, one day, uh, Victor humors Eli and decides to help him with his research. And one of the theories that Eli comes up with is that the way to become an EO is to have a near-death experience. And so, like, someone's heart stopping before they're revived. So, meaning that they were technically dead for a little while, but they're no longer dead, they're alive. And uh, using Victor's research on adrenaline, uh, it is used to kickstart you back to life, so you could theoretically end up with a permanent change instead of just one of those uh, changes that happen fast, like a mom picking up a car, mm-hmm. but she wouldn't be able to do that again without that adrenaline, that fight or flight. Um, so both Eli and Victor end up testing this theory out, and I will leave it there. This book kind of goes forward and back in time. So you have the time of them in college, and then you have the time of 10 years in the future. 
and mm -hmm. you have all these different cast of characters from like this girl who's only like 13 years old who I'm not going to spoil what kind of power she has but it is kind of like a superhero story mm -hmm. but it's more in the vein of the boys than it is like in the MCU like these people are not good people okay good to know <laughs> but yeah it's a super interesting story I, like literally I just like speed read through both of these books and I'm like V.E. Schwab, why are you doing this to me? Like, the first book, I literally, like, was anxious. I was like, I need to know what's happening next. And it was very rarely that a book gets me, like, anxious in a moment. Like, I'm like, what's going to happen to these characters? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I... Uh, I have read up and watched uh some of the boys um and i gotta say if if the book that you're describing like the village duology does kind of take that eo in that very darker sense in the sense that you know like people given these powers they're still people like you're not gonna have a yeah. superman who's over there like well i can literally do anything unless i'm stopped by a rock so i'll just uh be a boy scout right no, like he's gonna do whatever he wants yeah, and they go in like there's certain there's different people like one of them is a U.S. vet that was hit by a landmine and went into a coma. So and he comes out and not going to describe exactly what his power is, but like it's things like that. But then you also have people that it really just plays with like you have some people who there's one who he's just like a drunk he's a drunk and he's at home and his wife left him and everything and he's just <laughs> has his house and nothing else <laughs> and so like it's just normal regular everyday people that out of nowhere got a power they weren't even trying to get except for mm -hmm. eli and victor okay that's kind of cool we'll look into that all right. So one thing that we added last episode that I'm going to add again this episode, it might, it might be one of the topics that comes and goes depending on what guest I have. But since the person who introduced me to anime, for me to actually know what it is, because I did watch DBZ and Yu-Gi-Oh! as younger, but I thought mm -hmm. they were just regular American cartoons. <laughs> but I, I, I now know better. <laughs> so we're going to do our recent anime watch. I didn't watch any uh, anime this past week, but Walker, you have two animes that you want to talk yes. about. So. so these are, one of them is a is a recent watch. One of them is more of a rewatch. Mm -hmm. uh, so the rewatch is Welcome to Demon School, Irma Kun, which I'm caught up on the manga, which is fucking fantastic. Uh, so, D Welcome to Demon School, Irma Kun is is very intriguing from an anime perspective because it it doesn't it could kind of fall under an isekai, but not really. Which isekai, the definition of, is just transported to another world or another world. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, but the premise of it is, is that Irma is just this normal everyday kid who has been through some less than favorable situations because his parents are kind of terrible uh and then ends up being sold to a demon by his parents and the demon's just like he, he, he's thinking the worst but then the demon's like hey you know what i just i i didn't i'm not trying to like eat your soul or anything like, i just i'm lonely and i want a grandson will you be my grandson and he's like sure <laughs> and it just kind of follows his like slice of life misadventures and you think it's just kind of like one of those kind of rosario plus vampire dorky style animes until much like Rosario plus Vampire in the manga, it picks up out of nowhere. And suddenly things have a more serious tone while still keeping with that slice of life kind of student environment. And I enjoy it because all these demons have these crazy powers and personalities and, and looks and appearances. And Irma at first is freaked out by it, but then just starts fitting in because everyone's like, wow, you're the coolest demon we've ever met. And he's like, yes, demon. That is what I am. Is it uh, similar in the vein of like the devil is a part timer? Kind of. Um, except uh, instead of having like super awesome powers, his only real skills are. Okay, I, I take it back. He has one power that actually is really dumb, but kind of awesome. Because of like the dangerous life he's lived, he has what's called like uh, maximum crisis evasion. 
which basically means that he had like he's you know, when it comes to dodgeball this dude is amazing you want him on your team because he's never gonna get hit <laughs> but he literally just dodges out of the way of anything that he feels is a threat i, and I wouldn't mind that power <laughs> it's it's hilarious in some situations but he just his other ability is just being a good guy like he's just a nice person and people are kind of taken aback by that and it it (laughs) works out well for him so he could play dodgeball but he probably couldn't play like baseball or basketball because the ball would go towards and he'd be like (laughs) yeah pretty much and and they have like not to spoil anything but like halfway through the first season and it's like i think 20 chapters into the manga they they actually go over that because oh, nice. because the only way to advance uh his his rank in the school is to like compete in sport uh, and he's like ah i have to keep dodging and they're like no you can't and he's like but i will though and like but you can't so he he has to overcome that. And it's it's a pretty cool character arc. Like it takes up maybe like an episode or two of the a- anime, and it's actually really good. Like it's nice character development. Now, if I ever watch this, like I'm sure that that's gonna be the episode that becomes my favorite. Yeah, I just I love those like comedic moments like that. <laughs> <laughs> there's Wait, a lot. But... There's a lot of episodes that will be your favorite. Um, I think the one that will probably stand out most to you is actually the one uh, from the image that was shown earlier. I think it's like episode 22. It's later in the first season, but it's, it's a, it's a fun episode. It's a a musical like centered episode and it's very, uh, very amusing. And for people to know, Walker and I were both in marching band together. He played saxophone, I played yes. clarinet. So we're we're band nerds, we're band kids. Yes, it is it is solid ten out of ten. Like the actual music that they use in the episode is actually very good. Like they they do write uh they actually do write songs for the the show. There are a few songs that show up in the in the show, like the school anthem and whatnot, and the cast and characters actually do sing the songs, so it's Okay, it's pretty good, cool. and and I think on Crunchyroll and Verve they have both the English dub and the Japanese subs. You could watch either or. And what's funny is that most uh, Japanese uh, VO art like they're able to also sing too. Yeah, like, it's veering it's... off to like free, like even Tommy <laughs> Fun Club. Like all five of them sing the end credits. Yeah, I, for I think it. it's like um because I think it's a requirement. Like a lot of. Uh, in order to in- increase market talent, like a lot of them have to also be able to sing, so they take uh, acoustic lessons. Oh, I didn't know that. I she- think I uh, that's it's been a while. <laughs> Whether it's true or not, we're gonna take it as fact right now until we know better. <laughs> I mean, considering the amount of anime voice actors that sing their own openings and endings, I'd say yeah. it's probably true. <laughs> I mean, and the person, I'm forgetting his name, but he voices Makoto. He sings the opening for both, for all three seasons and, of Free and he ha- with his band. So he also has a band on the side. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I can voice I can, act, but I also have band. I also have band. And then uh, the next anime you wanted to talk about. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, Yashihime. So Yashihime just came out, um, and it's on... Funimation, Verve, Crunchyroll, Hulu, wherever you get your anime needs, you can find Yashihime. Um, it's kind of a sequel, spiritual successor to Inuyasha, uh, which is, if anybody, this is going to be showing our age, anybody who watched uh, Toonami anywhere between like the late 80s, early 90s to early 2000s, uh, you know Inuyasha. You, you yeah. know. Um, and... I, I to kind of like prepare myself for it. I also started rewatching Inuyasha episodes on Hulu. So this is because there aren't enough episodes of Yashihime out for me to actually like talk about it. I could just say a few things comparing it to the old show. Um, Yashihime does a pretty good job of like being like a spiritual successor to Inuyasha. It's very demon of the week. Um, and I will say this as someone who did watch old episodes of Inuyasha recently and watched. Um, episodes of Yashihime recently one of the complaints that people are I've seen on Verve about the new show is like I can't believe how dumb the protagonists are why don't they ever look into anything and and do that I'm like y'all do remember that Inuyasha like there were plenty of times where they're like 
uh, there's a jewel shard, but then like they'd forget that the person had the jewel shard and they'd just leave with it. And they'd be like, we'll run into them later, probably. <laughs> like with Koga of the Wolf Tribe. They let him go multiple times and no one ever questioned anything. They're just like, it's Koga. Like, whatever, it's cool. sure. <laughs> it's Koga, we're buddies. He'll he'll show up again. Um, And and that's, I don't feel like that's a problem. Like, I, I feel like if you're watching a, a shonen or, or like a... I all guess Inuyasha's a character. Yeah, all shonens do. It, yeah, it, you always have a dumb character, and and also like if you have a shonen with additional romantic subplots or romantic main plots, you're gonna have extra dumb characters. Like mm -hmm. that's just kind of par for the course. Like there's never a fully intelligent protagonist, or if they are, it's usually not a shonen show. <laughs> <laughs> like one of my favorite shonens even though i would say full metal alchemist brotherhood is my favorite anime out there and it's technically a shonen my f probably the one that i watched before a new anime was anime and that's got to be dragon ball z goku is dumb as hell yeah and and that, that again that's not to say that people in the shows can't be intelligent like for example if you if anyone's watched dragon ball super one of the things that uh one of the characters we said between Goku and Vegeta is that Goku's got more potential, but he's too kind hearted. And Vegeta is, is, you know, got all the good traits of a warrior, but he gets in his own head too much. Like he'll, he'll try and overthink the fight and that's what screws him over. <laughs> and for those of, uh, those watching that are younger than us, do they need to watch Inuyasha to watch Yashihime, or could they just go straight into it? You could just go straight into uh, Yashihime. It's honestly kind of set up in its own way. Like, I will admit, if you don't watch Inuyasha, or at least know of the characters, you're gonna be lost. Okay. When you get into the first episode, like, you'll be like, who are all these characters they're talking about? I don't understand anything, but for the most part, Yashihime does introduce their own new cast of characters, and um you know protagonists so you can just follow them and their adventures without having to go back and watch the entire like i think 500 or 600 episode run of inuyasha less than uh, one piece though <laughs> christ right um yeah no so you don't have to go back and watch the whole thing but if you want to make sure that you're up to date on the characters at least just go read the Wikipedia entries or something on like the, the five main characters and a few of the supporting cast and you'll be good to go. Speaking of one piece, how many episodes are they on now? Uh, last I checked, I think there's, they're passing um, 900. Hold on. I can just oh, Google this right now and it'll Jesus tell me. Christ. Oh my gosh. One Piece episodes. Uh, I think I've only watched like a hundred and something of them, and I've been kind of wanting to go back. Yeah, nine hundred and fifty-one. That's that's a lot of episodes. Yeah, nine hundred and fifty-one. Jesus Christ. Uh, I I will say this. Uh, thanks to uh Oda doing what he's done. Uh, if you watch all the way up to the two year time skip, which is still like a lot of episodes, I think it's like four hundred or so, five hundred episodes. You could just then take a break for a long time because they're they're going on a two year time skip. You could take a two year time skip. You don't need to remember anything when you come back. <laughs> All, right. All right. So I guess we'll go into our next segment, which is uh, recent TV watched. What have you recently watched? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the only TV, or at least live TV, that I feel like I've watched is The Mandalorian, and I am 130% about everything that this is. Like, me as a kid, I, I grew up on extended universe stuff. Like, even though I wasn't there for the original trilogy, which came out in the 60s, and a lot of the original like, EU books, once I 77, became... 77. The yeah. original trilogy, 77. Uh, like, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Whatever time frame that they came out. Uh <laughs> And all I think the, you were thinking of Star Trek for a second. Maybe. It's 60s, 70s are basically the same same decade. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the exact same decade. Uh, no, but um, I wasn't there for a lot of the original Extended Universe content release, but then when I turned like 15 or whatever, I just binged the crap out of everything I could get my hands on. Um, 
And there were a lot of like darker EU storylines, but one of the things that always fascinated me was Mandalorian culture and how intricately it ties in with Jedi and Sith culture because Mandalorian's spoiler alert, if anyone hasn't brushed up on Star Wars lore since the Disney buyout, Mandalorians aren't actually a race. Mm-hmm. Like there were a, a group of people that followed a Mandalore and there's a planet Mandalore and they are people who call themselves Mandalorians who hail from that planet. But being a Mandalorian is more of an ideology. It is a warrior's code and creed that you follow and you this support your clan. Yeah. And, and I like the Mandalorian because it follows, we, we get to see more of kind of that, lens but it also gives us that that space western feeling of you know this is and it's very much like that because if you look at the the galactic civil war as like historically our american civil war like following that war there was the expansion into the west which saw a lot of not heavy government policing for things and while there were outlaws like there weren't create like there weren't super the the idea of the western outlaws has been romanticized by hollywood and that's what they did with the mandalorian they're like you know what we're just gonna crank it up to a hundred star wars outlaws in space (laughs) pretty much like and it's good like i that now i I do wish they'd like give us more insight on the bounty hunters guild um because that's been around for a while but we've never really seen any insight into how it works because usually people will just be like i'm a bounty hunter and then that's kind of it like they'll be like i like it doesn't seem to matter what job they take like you think a bounty hunter would be taking lawful jobs because they are hunting bounties but it i don't know it bounty hunter is such a weird vague term in star wars that i i need more context on what the guild actually does (laughs) And I think we're probably going to see it, if not in a show or a movie, we'll see it in a a a, comic or something. In a comic or a book, which would be nice. But I also like that we're seeing kind of like post-Republic or post-Empire Star Wars, but pre-First Order, like new trilogy stuff. It's it's funny, like how much lore on the Jedi that the, the Outer Rim and just society as a whole seems to have lost. It's actually really cool. A just a uh, minor spoiler when you uh, when you have Dinjar and the Mandalorian saying like "May the Force be with you," but he doesn't know what Jedi are. So it's like, is that just something that everyone says without knowing the context? Yeah, like I I feel like because it's it the Jedi have been or, or like the Jedi and the Sith and the Force have been kind of like an integral part of the galaxy for so long that there's just phrases and things that go it's around normal that vernacular no one, um, now yeah like it's just like mandalorian saying this is the way even if they don't know what the way is anymore <laughs> because they've either been conquered had conquered or or otherwise lost all disparity with their centralized culture yeah they still follow whatever central creed they pick out for themselves and it's it's very interesting this show has been my ish these last two years and just having a show that's both episodic, but then also has an overarching theme. And just having, like, the first two episodes of uh, this season was, like, Monster of the Week. Yeah. That that second episode, ooh, heebie-jeebies. Yeah, <laughs> and on top of that, like, I'm going to catch flack for this, but I don't care. Like, he's not the child, it's Baby Yoda. Like, yes. it's the, the, the journey and saga of Baby Yoda learning to eat things and then not eating things and then getting in trouble for doing things like and using the force to eat things <laughs> like it, it's it is amusing because this is very much like by its species standards a child it doesn't get the idea that what it's doing is right or wrong it's just like I- i'm hungry i'm gonna i'm gonna do this and <laughs> I, I like the kind of protector vibe that him and, and the Mandalorian uh, Din Djarin have. Like, it's it's good. It- yeah. it, it's good, and just a quick shout-out, we do have Mandalorian uh, reaction shows on the Media Sweaties Network uh, YouTube channel here. They uh, come out typically 
like the day or two after the uh, episode comes out on Friday. So hopefully maybe we can have Walker on one of those episodes in the future. I would so love where to. We can, where we can actually talk spoiler stuff. Because <laughs> you and I are trying to stay very, very vague right now. Go very vague. It. As vague as possible. Like, there's a lot that I want to talk about about The Mandalorian, but I can't because... Either my family doesn't watch it or the people that uh, that watch it w- uh, with me don't get as much Star Wars stuff as I do. Well, you always have me to yes. kind of talk your Mandalorian stuff with. <laughs> <laughs> you should have known. I, I'm probably one of your nerdiest friends. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> compared to the friends that I talk with re- uh, right now from college, like you are easily top three of my nerdiest friends. Hey. I take that as a compliment. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So we're going to go into mine a little less nerdy TV show, but this is something that I watch probably, although right now it's coming out like week to week, but before me and my parents binge this show and we would watch it almost every night together. And that is the great, British Bake Off, Great British Baking Show, depending on what side of the pond you live on. These are now our our recent four that are in. Uh, The judges and the host of the show has changed several times. and But we've been watching this on Netflix, and it's just such a soothing show. You're just watching very polite British people bake baked goods and be very nice to each other and help each other out even though they're in a competition with one another yeah it's it's i i haven't watched as much of it but during the holiday season it's one of my favorite things to watch because when they do all like the christmas theme challenges i'm like oh yes (laughs) recipes thank you i will (laughs) i will keep these and one of the funniest things too is so I'm Cuban, for some of you that may know or may not know. So one of the things that we make, a dessert we make, is flan, which we use caramel on it, which is just sugar in a pan. You leave the sugar on the pan there to make the caramel. You let it be, and then once it's finally, like, starts, you mix it a little bit, and then it's done. You make sure that you put it at the bottom before it cools down, otherwise it's going to be that hard caramel. These people have such a hard time making caramel <laughs> in England. It's literally, they're like, oh, it's it's crystallizing. And I'm like, leave it alone. Put it in the pan and leave it alone. And they're adding water to it. And they're doing You're stuff. Like- <laughs> <laughs> Just leave it. Let it be. <laughs> See, and that, 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 <laughs> that, that, be. That's part of the thing, too, is that, like, and, and this is <laughs> from... My family has uh, has done like a lot of baking and shit in their lifetime. Um, and the thing that amuses me is that like d- different regions will do things exceptionally differently. Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> uh, I've got all my family in South Carolina that will brew their sweet tea like what they consider traditionally, which is the like steep hot water, and then they'll pour in with tea bags, and they'll just add however much sweet and low can give them cancer without killing them outright. And then they'll just drink that. Like it's nothing. Uh, whereas all my family in East Tennessee will, uh, steep the tea bags in with the tea while the water's boiling. And then just be like, that's tea and (laughs) add whatever sweetener they want to it. Even if like they'll mix sweeteners, I've seen them put in like actual sugar with Splenda and like a few equal. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what what you're doing, but that's, that's not like it's tea, but I don't know what you've done to it. Well, it's East Tennessee. What do you expect? Fair enough. At least Um, it's not Kentucky. (laughs) (laughs) But But no, like I worked at McDonald's and one time we literally to make a gallon, we would put the tea on and then it would drip down into the gallon bucket and then we put five pounds of sugar into it and that that, that's the sweet tea at mcdonald's and it's it's uh, as someone who never really goes to mcdonald's but like when he does we'll get sweet tea because it's the only thing i can palatably drink uh it's it's good it's if i mean if you it's good for (laughs) for people who grew up in the south which we went to high school in Tennessee, and then I also went to college in Kentucky. So they all love like Chattanooga. <laughs> they all love 
McDonald's sweet tea, and for me, it's just way too sweet. Yeah. But I'm also, like, <laughs> different ethnicity and also from South Florida, which, I mean, we have our own problems down here. <laughs> <laughs> I love how we just were like, let all us talk about sweet tea. <laughs> what? This is sweet tea hours now. Yes. This has now become the sweet tea show. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go now into the next topic, which is uh, recent movies watched. Uh, Walker didn't watch a movie this, just like I didn't watch an anime this past week. Yeah, I don't watch so. any movies. <laughs> It's perfectly fine. So we're going to go into the movie that I watched recently, which, funny enough, I watched this recently with my mom because I had seen it multiple times and it's a very good movie. But the, there's like a massive sex scene at the very, very beginning. So I was like, mom, warning. And she's like, you're old enough now that I don't care to watch this. Like, I don't care about watching this with you. <laughs> But, like, it was one of those, like, it's a good movie, I know my mom will enjoy it, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, this is a little awkward that we're watching this together, but still. <laughs> and it's called Y Tu Mama Tambien, and it came out in 2001, and it is in Spanish. It's uh, set in Mexico, so, like, even though... I do speak Spanish and understand Spanish. I still needed the English subtitles for some things because they say things different than a uh, Cuban say thing. And they also, since they're two young boys, um, they have their slang, which Mexican slang is very different from uh, Cuban slang. Like I had to learn like what a huevo and other things that they were saying. Like I was just like, oh, that's what that means. I didn't know that because <laughs> that's not how we say it. <laughs> And it just shows you, too, like, how different Latinos are just depending on from country to country. But uh, you have two young boys. One is Tenoch, played by uh, Diego Luna. And the other one is Julio, played by Gael Garcia Bernal, which uh, for any of you English-speaking audience, uh, he voices Hector in Coco. So now as an adult, and then you Diego Luna, Star Wars. Cassie and Andor. So solid. <laughs> but this is them as young boys. So they're it, it's really weird to see Diego Luna like without the beard and mustache and just like baby faced. <laughs> like super baby faced. And um so uh Tenoch's um cousin is uh like we meet him and uh their his wife kind of like you meet them at a wedding and that's the last time you see of his cousin because like his cousin basically calls up his wife and is like i'm cheating on you but i love you and then she decides that she's gonna go off and on this summer trip with these two young boys so i think like we're never told what her age is but i think she's like late 20s early 30s and like these boys are probably like around 17 18 years old so it's kind of funny that they're going on this trip together and these boys who invited her to go with them didn't ever think that she was actually gonna go so they were like oh let's go to um in english it's called heaven's uh, mouth boca de cielo we're gonna go to this beach goes it's very private only the local fishermen know where it is they're they're in Mexico City, so that means they have to drive out because Mexico City's in the center of the country. And um, so they basically are driving to God knows where. They don't know where they're going. It's just this, like, road trip to the beach between these two young boys and this slightly older woman than them. And it's just a very, very interesting story. It did, um, it was nominated for a few Oscars. Uh, Alfonso Cuaron is the uh, uh, writer and director and I think his brother also wrote the um, the screenplay with him and they were uh, nominated for uh, I think original it's an original screenplay so it's it's got that Oscar worthiness so like obviously then it's good right <laughs> <laughs> but I really enjoy this movie because even if you don't speak Spanish it is a good movie to watch you just put the subtitles on which i know for someone like you and i we watch 
Japanese anime, so subtitles all day. Subtitles are nothing. <laughs> subtitles are nothing. <laughs> so Yeah, but, I'm just yeah. over here awakening my manga Kyo Sharingan as I read anime subtitles and I'll just I'll do the same with any other language's subtitles. Right. I, that's funny too, just going on to I saw last year um Pain and Glory Dolori Gloria with Antonio Banderas, that movie. Mm-hmm. And it was in the movie theater, it's set in Spain. They're speaking Spanish, English subtitles. The English subtitles didn't fully match what they were saying in Spanish. So I was like, oh, I have a slight advantage here knowing what they're actually saying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, that one too, since I just uh, said it, that one's a good recommendation to watch as well. Okay. Thank you. But now we're going to go into our anything extra, which is, is just all different extra things, video games, music, whatnot. So what is your uh, anything extra this week? So my anything extra that I've been playing religiously uh, is Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And my reason for doing that is because uh, a lot of people, due to like their ga- like pro gamer status... Which some of them actually are pro gamers, and I, I, I apologize for the air quotes. I, I didn't. I, I do a thing. Um, got like copies of the game like a week or two weeks early, and so I had to avoid YouTube like the plague for spoilers. Didn't work out for me because uh, I'm like, oh, let's look at this thing. Like you know, top twenty things you need to know about the game before you play, and then suddenly my YouTube recommendations is, hey, here's this big spoiler that happens in the middle of the game, and I'm like, in the title, full title, all caps. Like I'm like, I hate when people do that. Thanks. <laughs> so I've been trying to play through the game so I can get as much of the story in as I can before everything is like ruined for me. Mm-hmm. Um. And overall, it's a very good game. Like, uh, for I, I don't know how I was telling you earlier. I don't know how well it stacks up as an Assassin's Creed game, because the main thing about Assassin's Creed has always been like the conflict between like assassins and Templars, and with Origins and Odyssey, like they kind of got away from that a bit. Like they worked in the vein of like these proto assassins and proto Templars. Like they don't have the name, but we know who they are. Uh, and like a lot of them were still very involved with the story. Like your whole mission in origins was becoming the assassins. It was hunting down these individuals, you know, who are, who are corrupting and messing with the government and, and the military and all these like political and religious organizations. And your goal is to take them out and you go about doing that. And, and you go through some nice character development, even though people like, absolutely hated on origins because they're like it's just a dark souls clone it's an assassin's creed game i'm like it's it's really good like the only complaints i have about it is that the scenery doesn't change much like it's a very big open world and like 80 percent of it is desert so i'm like cool sand dune sand dune sand dune city (laughs) and it it reminds me of all the times as a youth that i had severe adhd (laughs) <laughs> um and then odyssey is good too like it, it has like the changing scenery and the ocean is way too big like the, again the, the only complaints i ever have about these games is that the world is getting too big hmm. um but that, that your adhd is like oh i need to go explore over there yeah i'm like oh i have to I have to pop into here pop into there pop into there pop into there i'm like all right the map is complete now what <laughs> That um, reminds me of Ben, where if we would be like getting information, oh and God. you'd be like off looking somewhere. I'd be like, Walker, I could never figure out the correct dosage of Adderall <laughs> or Ritalin to get me <laughs> centered. And on top of that, there were other factors too. Like if I didn't drink enough water that day, I was useless. <laughs> where I'd be like, I'd be like, Walker, drink your water. I don't want to drink your water. <laughs> and then there was the, the one time when before a live performance at the actual football stadium, I passed out. And that was embarrassing. Um, hey, I, I've done it too, which I did it here when we played the bowl game because I also did marching band in college here in Miami. The bowl game was the Miami Beach bowl game. And our we were wool head to toe. Because at least... Our uh, uniforms wow. in high school were not wool. They were like some polyester kind They're of thing. Like polyester felt 
kind of yeah. material, like. But the ones in college were are wool. all wool, wool, and so we were just head like to toe in wool, and you know the long sleeve, the yeah. thick jacket. That oh my god! And so I was just there, and I was overheating. And then I, I kind of like just fell on a palm tree and went down. And then some very nice fan handed me her cold water as they <laughs> took my jacket off. <laughs> you know, it was it was the jacket where it's zip in the back, so I couldn't take my jacket off. I yeah. needed someone else to help. Which uh, for non band kids out there, the zippers typically in the back. So we would yell out in a band when we went in high school, going, "I need a hooker," because there was a hook at the top. <laughs> so you would need someone to zip you up and hook you in. So you go, "I need a hooker <laughs> to help you out." And all the adults hated it. Yep. Um. <laughs> But yeah, no, like as an Assassin's Creed game, I don't know how well it stacks up because the conflict isn't the central point of the game. But as like a, a kind of RPG, which is what they're trying to move into now with Assassin's Creed, it holds up very well. Like you, <clears throat> historically, there's a lot of anachronism, so I'm not going to get on that crap. But uh, the the whole purpose of Valhalla is that you set out with your Viking clan to settle in England, and during like this kind of very tumultuous viking like golden viking age which is like the i think eighth to ninth century england um and it's it's very good like the the combat's very smooth the leveling system is pretty neat and on top of that like there's a lot of settings in the game you can tweak and change to make it however you want uh and the exploration is a huge fun part of the game and there's some missions that just will make me chuckle with how dumb they are. Uh, like one that I told a coworker about is there's literally these two brothers that are like, we need to learn how to raid so we can join the Vikings. And I'm like, all right, you're, you're going to pay me to, to teach you how to raid on this village. Sure. Why not? And I just <laughs> chucked a torch on the house and they're like, great. Now that our house is on fire, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and, and they literally put all their valuables into their burning house. And they're like, we forgot the key and i'm like what is wrong with the both of you <laughs> and so i stole all their stuff and they're like did you find any of our valuables in the house and i'm like no <laughs> and i left with all their stuff nice so we'll go into my anything extra which is something I forgot how far you've gotten into this. I've only seen up to season <laughs> three, but I was rewatching it and I've only rewatched the first season of it. And that is Ruby, R W B Y. And yes. rest in peace, Monty Um, yes. the creator of the show. I'm glad that they were able to continue it after him, mm -hmm. depending on if the show fell or not after him is a, is yeah, a different conversation. Uh, that, that's, that's a conversation that the fans are still split on. Yes. Um, which my opinion on it is he had influence on the creative writing process, but a lot of the writing throughout the day to day was still handled by miles and Carrie. So any fa failings of the show were possibly in like intrinsic to the way it was being done. And, I'm glad things have changed now. Uh, there's things I'm not happy about, but that's just kind of like you can't, uh, there's never a perfect show. Each show okay. is going to have pull with one group of people or another. Like that's just the bottom line. And for those who are like, who are these names that you're talking about? This is a rooster teeth production. Yeah. So, uh, miles Luna and Sherry, uh, Sherry. Carrie Shawcross are the two lead writers for the show of Ruby, and they brought on someone recently for seasons seven and eight, uh, which season eight out now on their website and on Verve. Go I check have it out. Not seen yet of those, so I've only seen the first se three seasons of it. And my preferred way to actually watch it, I own the DVD for the first season, and you can watch it as a movie. And that is my preferred way of watching the first season. I don't know if they did that with the other ones. I th th they did. I want to say it's... See, here's the thing that, I, that frustrates me. is I feel like at one point Ruby was on Netflix. I don't know if it's still on Netflix. No. Is the it, issue. 
it's on Rooster Teeth with commercials. And the uh. thing is, like, the episode has, like, the two minute commercial in the middle mm -hmm. of it, and some of these episodes are only five minutes long. Yeah, and you're getting the um, which is a banger of a song, but you're getting it like every five, ten, fifteen minutes of the same like opening song over and over again. When if you watch it as a movie, you get it at the very beginning, you get it at the very end, you watch that full like what is it, an hour or yeah. so, and um. But yeah, basically what Ruby is from Google, because it's a supernatural universe of remnant, four strong girls are training to become huntresses, which are humanity's only hope of defeating the shadowy and threatening creatures known as Grimm. So it is very much a fairy tale oriented. All of them are have names and based off of fairy tale characters. Ruby, who is the leader of RWBY Ruby uh, is um, based off of Red Riding Hood. Weiss is based off Snow White. Um, you have Blake based off like the Beauty and the Beast character. And then you have Yang. She's Goldilocks, right? Yeah, Goldilocks. Yeah, based off of Goldilocks. So each of them, you have like the um, teacher of their school is based off the Wizard of Oz his uh, Professor Ozpin, so pretty yeah. much you, and then his, uh, like, one of the teachers is Glenda Goodwitch, which is basically Witch. off of Glenda the Goodwitch, <laughs> so. Um, then on top of that, you have other professors that show up, um, one of which who still confounds me to this day, Professor Ublick. I don't know what he's supposed to be. I, 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 I still don't know. I don't know. I, I know that Peter Port, who's another professor in the show, is meant to be like uh, from the, the, the old Slavic tale, like, like Peter and the Wolf. Like that's what the. But a lot of them are fairy tale inspired or like just literature or story inspired. Like you've got um, one of my favorite characters who comes in towards the tail end of season one, uh, Sun Wukong, who is literally yes. Sun Wukong the Monkey King. <laughs> Goku. He's Goku. He's Goku. <laughs> um, and you've got like a couple other characters that show up. Um, and, and there's a lot of cool nods in the show too. Like another main team that kind of is a main point for seasons one through three, as well as uh, seasons beyond. Um, team Juniper are based off of like gender bent versions of like historical figures. So Jean Arc is Joan of Arc. Uh, yep. Pyrrha Nikos is Achilles. Um, Nora Valkyrie is Thor. Yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, Lyran is based off of Mulan. And they did get some, like, anime uh, voice actors to be part of this. Like, Vic Mignogna is part of it. He plays Crow. And you have yeah. Travis Willingham. I think Laura Bailey even did, like, a small character. She might have actually had... Hold on. She might still be in the show. No, wait, no. I don't know. Uh, but Travis Willingham's still in it, I think. To a degree. Like the, that is my favorite voice actor couple there, and their baby is so cute. Even though it's not. Oh, really Ronan! Yeah, anymore. he's amazing. Yeah. He's beautiful. He's a good boy. But uh, I guess that is my anything extra. As Walker is doing his research over there, <laughs> his hard hitting research. <laughs> and, all, all, all of two Google searches. Yes. Uh, but uh, while he's doing that. I'll uh, close this up and go just thank you, Walker, for joining me today and um, having this pleasure. conversation and just talking about things that we recently did. I always <laughs> enjoy talking about nerdy things with you because you always introduce me to too many things that I have to add to my list to watch. <laughs> and I'm like, the okay. list that never, no, like, it's the same with me. I've got friends who are like, hey, have you watched all these new anime? I'm like, no, I've rewatched Code Geass for the fifteenth time because it makes me happy. <laughs> that that happens to me all the time. Where I'm like, why am I rewatching the show or this movie or rereading this book when there are so many things that I want, like on my TBR or that I want to watch? But I'm just <laughs> like, no, I'm gonna continue going back into my nostalgia of things that I love because I know I already like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, where can the people find you if they want to look up where you are? Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at WalkmanEXE. Uh, I don't 
post as much as I used to, because uh, a lot of the Corgi Twitters that I would follow have stopped posting videos, so you don't get as many retweets. Um, but uh, you can also find me on YouTube, which is where I'm way more active. Uh, also, Walk Maniac C. I do a lot of Dungeons and Dragons uh, like recordings. Basically, I'll play like D and D campaigns with me and my friends, and we'll record our episodes. It, I wouldn't call it a podcast because it's not audio only but it, it's like a podcast it's just us telling the narrative and occasionally we'll break character and tell jokes and just shoot the shit so uh, if y'all enjoy critical role or other D podcasts please give mine a look you know like just content it's good. Yay, more content because we need it for as long as we're probably gonna have to be in lockdown <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, like I've got uh, organized playlists on my channel. So if anyone wants to check out any of my campaigns, you'll see them titled by their name. Like I've got Platinum Watch, Lost Tales of Ardaith, uh, Distant Wanderers, um, Legends of Stone Harbor. They, they're all organized. So you'll, all you'll the find things. them all there. All the things. And you can find me at Sol Govin on Twitter and at Sol.k.govin on Instagram. And here every Wednesday for Soul Talk. Thank you guys for uh, watching and uh, see you next week. Bye.